just get started. And um, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. This is Dean Smith from HPRCT, and welcome to this month's session on um, why the scale is not your friend. So Joe Esty from Lucas Engineering and Management Services is going to present, I, I'll say present, but I think Joe is probably is more of a dialogue, right? In terms mm -hmm. of I would hope so. some thoughts, some Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I would hope so. And especially at the end when we have time to uh, uh, settle in, having gone through some of the dialogue between us, we'll have a chance to stick around if you like and compare notes, experiences, and future expectations on how some of this might be used. That's perfect. So yeah, everybody, um, we'll turn it over to Joe in just a second. And as always, we wanna make this as interactive as possible. So you know, feel free to chat questions into the chat box, unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever it takes so we can focus this on, on Joe's wisdom um, and also your questions on how you can apply this. So Joe, the floor is yours. Hey, I appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody, especially those early risers like myself on the West Coast. And for those of you who are about midday or early, uh, just starting the lunch area on the East Coast, uh, to what I think is one of the most important topics that is often neglected or not given the attention that it's due. Uh, many people believe they're measuring success, learning from failure, uh, figuring out what the metrics are that go along with both. But because we are not always that good at math and people aren't always good at understanding how equations work, meaning how does the front end of that equation affect the product at the end, I think a lot of people just accept what has traditionally been measured without question. And so um, I've done a lot of study lately. And if you can see the books listed on the slide, I think those are some of the, the better resourced but differently voiced uh, materials that are out there. They're not gonna tell you the same story in the same way. They're gonna give you different dimensions and perspectives of the mystery of metrics. Uh, from Upstream by Dan Heath, who talks about the data we need to learn from versus the data we normally uh, collect and inspect. Uh, to one of my favorites recently, uh, Beyond Performance 2.0, uh, where they make a real case that the top 1% quartile companies are those that pay attention to two types of metrics, not lagging and leading indicators, but those that measure the performance of the organization and the health of the organization. And as you probably know in your experience, the performance of the organization is usually the one people target, but it means nothing if you don't have something to measure the health of the organization. And one of my favorite writers on the whole area of safety heresies, uh, a person who self-admittedly bucks against the traditional approach when it comes to managing events and understanding what happens. Carson Bush wrote a great book on if you can't measure it, maybe you shouldn't. And he really defends why zero will always get you zero in terms of effort and benefit if you don't have a more meaningful metric that you can measure. And then uh, my friend, Tony Mashera, excellent book with a, an appendix that lists some of the leading indicators he's been made aware of, as well as companies have shared with him. Uh, it's a great resource to figure out if leading indicators are new to you, what they might look like and uh, sound like. And of course, uh, I'd, I'd be uh, remiss in my studies if I didn't mention the great book by Sidney Decker, uh, Woods and others, on the century that we've gone through and the foundations of safety science, particularly the second to the last chapter that talks about how we rely too often on surveys to measure what's going on in the organization rather than going out there and seeing what's going on in the organization. I'm gonna make a case for that. It's, uh, I'll share my opinion of surveys, having taken them for four decades and two years in the workplace, and then also working with companies to design better intervention strategies based on the information they're collecting. So if we uh, continue, uh, I'll just start off with what we've known for about 30 years. A lot of books have been published with experiences of high performance teams, and almost all of them can be condensed down into the five keys for what high performance looks like. Number one, you have to have a purpose and you have to know why you exist. Without a purpose, you can't measure anything. So when we start an endeavor, when we run an organization, when we begin a company, there's gotta be a purpose that we're serving. Why do we exist? 
One of my favorite questions to ask people who are in their position is that if you were missing today, who would miss you the most? Now, somebody's got to miss you. So if you weren't occupying that role and responsibility slot and you were the person that was missing, what would they miss most about you not being in that position? Why does your position exist? What role do you fill? So why do we exist? Values then drive the behavior as a group. If we exist for a purpose, we ought to have a common set of values that drive us towards that purpose. And the goals that we uh, put in place should actually match the big picture achievement we're trying to obtain. I think every one of us has worked for an organization who had a stated purpose, but they were very divergent in their goals. They would go to a conference, they'd go to a seminar, they'd benchmark against another company, and those benchmarks on those things they gathered at the conference had nothing to do with their overall purpose, but they thought they were a pretty cool idea to implement. So when they did it, it didn't meet the purpose and therefore they experienced failure. Uh, so the activities ought to match our purpose and they ought to be questioned on a routine basis. Are the objectives and activities we put in place really getting us to that big picture? And then obviously one of the weak links is not everybody is always clear on who should do what. As Henry Ford said, the person who should sing tenor is the person who can sing tenor. Uh, sometimes we assign a role to someone without the commensurate skills and ability to complete it, hoping to stretch them in their position. And sometimes it's an ill fit and it isn't the fault of the person who's been assigned. It's overall not understanding what role they ought to play. So who should do what? And the thing that I think is the most neglected and often used but not really paid attention to is what does success look like? What are the measurements that tie us back to our purpose? This is the thing I'd like to spend some time discussing with you today. Uh, we've all been either the victims or benefactors of measurements that have been put in place. We have gone headlong into something, not realizing it was gonna turn out a certain way, all because the metrics drove us to it. That's what we were trying to achieve. And we've ignored some things that should have been measured otherwise. So when we take a look at what success looks like, let me tell you a little bit about two weeks of failure. And then you'll understand, I hope along with me, why one day you might be in the same position I found myself in two weeks ago and why you might wanna do something about it before you experience that failure. As some of you know, unfortunately, about two years ago, I was diagnosed with some spinal tumors and they'd had a very successful surgery and they found another one and treated that with radiation therapy. Uh, but things weren't healing as well as they should have been healing. And so my physician uh, wanted them to do some blood tests because the original blood tests, and I gotta admit this, my healthcare provider went to school is very sharp in the medical arts, not so great at a bedside manner. I know that's a rarity when it comes to doctors, but not really great at telling you the truth that would be softly received. And he said, hey, Joe, the initial diagnosis is, is you're suffering from the four horsemen of the human apocalypse. I don't think anybody ever went to a doctor to wanna hear that. And he said, now the good thing is, is those four horsemen ride in together, but if you pick one of them off, they all go away together. So the trick is figuring out which one of those we're gonna pick off. And so that's gonna require some blood work. So about two weeks ago, he established a, 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 a lab procedure for me at a local laboratory. Uh, and it was gonna take two hours, having fasted about 18 hours the day before, for them to draw 12 vials. Things were going along okay, at least in my head, until they were 15 minutes late in the final blood drawing. And the phlebotomist didn't come in to get me, the lab manager did. And she took me over to her office and she said, hey, there's no easy way to say this, so I'm just gonna tell you, all day long, we've been taking blood in the wrong tube and it's been going into the wrong vials. So we're gonna scrap this and we're gonna do it all over again in three days. You're gonna have to fast, you're gonna have to come back in. That's not news anybody wants to hear. Now, as a human performance practitioner, I'm used to seeing a story build towards an inevitable but unhappy conclusion. We've got all kinds of train derailments and planes that go down and plants that blow up. And along the way, there are air precursors and flawed defenses and latent organizational weaknesses 
that after the story has been experienced, you now see how it happened. But along the way, you just don't see those things lining up in all the wrong ways. Well, I looked back over my day that day and I realized that at some point in time, I should have stopped what was going on because I know better than that. You see, when I got there, the receptionist didn't have me on her list. I'm Joe Westy. I'm here at eight o'clock. She said, we don't have you down. And she said, but the person who normally does the scheduling isn't here right now. At eight o'clock, she comes in. Maybe she knows. So I waited patiently. And the gal who normally comes in to do the scheduling had her arms filled with birthday bags, all kinds of streamers and gifts. And instead of going to the schedule, she went over to the phlebotanist's office and she highly decorated it. And you heard a lot of laughter in there because they were having a pretty good time. At 8.15, 15 minutes after my appointment was set, she came out and said, oh, no, he's on here. But you're new here, only having been here two days. Uh, you probably didn't know we keep a list of the walk-ins separate than the appointments. So there are a couple of air precursors here I should have seen coming. A new receptionist doesn't have a clue I'm there. They've got distractions with the big birthday party going on. But trust me, I'm not worried about it at this time. And then suddenly, when I get my first blood drawing, a senior citizen van shows up outside with 15 of the most cranky senior citizens I've experienced in my life. They marched into the room all at one time, though the sign clearly says five people at a time, and none of them were wearing their masks for corona control. And the receptionist said, hey, I'm sorry, you have to put your mask on. We don't like it. We don't want to do it. We're just here to get our blood. And she told him, well, only a few of you can be in here. And, and by the way, I don't see you on the list. She checked with the other person at the front. They weren't on the list. They were at the wrong laboratory, even though they're part of the same family of laboratories. So now what they should have been, what should have happened is probably sent back to the right laboratory. But the receptionist said, we'll accommodate you. It'll just add to our schedule. So you'll have to be patient. Now understand, while all this is going on, I can see it happening, but I'm not getting how this is going to end. There were a variety of things that just weren't right that day. I'm familiar with task and process. Uh, there are a lot of distractions. There's a lot of time pressure going on. It would have been more surprising had things have gone well. So I promised myself come that Saturday, I wasn't going to relive that same experience. I was going to say something if I saw something. Because you know, I'm in this business and, and it would be irresponsible not to do otherwise. So Saturday rolls around, I go back to the same lab. Things are a little bit calmer because it's a Saturday. The first phlebotanist took a great deal of time explaining the vial process and what the different colored caps meant and why she was doing what she was doing. And she admitted up front, we don't wanna make this mistake that we made earlier. So I'm feeling pretty trusting. Then the second phlebotanist on the second drawing brought me into the same room, but grabbed a different colored vial with a different colored cap. And I said to myself, I'm not sure if there's an error that's gonna be made, but as many of you know, there are six different types of mitigating speech from the softest one being hinting around to something to the highest and most effective one being a direct command to do something. And I started off with the hinting. I just asked her, hey, you know, why do they pull insulin in one vial and then they pull the glucose in another vial? Just a simple question. She looked at the paperwork and then looked at me and said, crap, I'm pulling the wrong sample. Now, same lab, two different days, two different phlebotomists making exactly the same mistakes. I think we'd agree they have an issue with a system that doesn't prevent errors rather than any independent phlebotomist trying to get things wrong. Their system obviously needs to be fixed. And here's where measurement comes in. I wondered to myself at that time, I wonder what specific metrics this lab uses to measure success and do the people who perform the work even know what those metrics mean? Number one, do they even measure things? And number two, can the people in that clinic point to how they affect those things? I'm willing to bet that that lab measures the amount of time it takes to see a patient and draw blood. They measured the quantity of samples that have been pulled. I would hope they'd measure those that need to be re-pulled because of errors, but I'm not entirely sure of that. And I'm just saying that there's a reason people do the things they do, and a lot of it has to do with what success looks like. And if there's not a picture of it 
clearly painted for the people doing the work, you can expect them to paint their own picture. We either provide that picture or they can paint it themselves. Years ago, I heard this story and it always resonated with me when I think about my own goals and my own purpose. And in 1996, there was a young gal from Hillsborough, Oregon uh, named Tiffany Milbrick. And surprisingly, the United States women's soccer team in that Olympics that year beat the top three favorites, Mexico, Brazil, and especially China. And in the final game, Tiffany was one of the ones to score one of the two goals that put her on top. Now what Newsweek Magazine saw was she celebrated differently than everybody else who formed the human pyramid, as many athletes do on the field, elated by their success. She quietly went over, sat down with her family and friends. She had that gold around her neck and uh, uh, Newsweek walked over and said, hey, you're Tiffany, right? The gal from Oregon. And, and you scored one of those goals against the team. Why aren't you out there celebrating with your friends on the field? And she said, oh, I'm excited about winning. I'm just not very surprised. And caught the Newsweek reporter off guard and she said, what do you mean you're not very surprised? She said, oh, when I was a little girl in second grade, I came home after school and I painted a picture of being in the Olympics. And then when third grade rolled around, I took that picture down and I put a new picture up. And every year that school would start, the thing I would do before school started is paint a new picture of where I wanted to be when I was 18. And here I am. So I'm pretty excited. I'm just not very surprised. Now the Newsweek reporter questioned her and said, without understanding the relationship between the goal and what you do every day to achieve it, and said, well, you know, that was a big risk. What if you had spent all that time doing what you were doing, focused on that picture, and you didn't win in the Olympics? She said, that's not the gold that I was after. So here's the whole point. You see, the reporter saw the metric being the gold medal. And if you didn't hit the gold medal, then it wasn't worth taking the trip. Every organization sets a standard for gold. They have a zero metric. They have no lost workday cases, zero defects. And that might be the gold standard, but it's the process along the way that has to be incrementally uh, assessed, uh, refocused. Uh, there has to be greater invigoration to achieve it, regardless if the gold we get is the one that somebody else thought we should be after. So I'm gonna give this for your consideration as we look at metrics. Number one, we normally know that systems produce the results we're getting, and so they do produce our metrics, but metrics drive our system. And that is often lost on the people who set them. I'll say that again, I'm gonna give you an example. Systems produce our metrics, but metrics drive our system. And we believe we're building a system that will give us an outcome. I'm gonna tell you if it's the wrong outcome, it's gonna drive your system in a way you never anticipated. I was an environmental manager and I experienced what Kathy O'Neill often says is the weapon of math destruction when an outcome, the math, drives you to things you shouldn't be doing. I love that phrase, weapons of math destruction. Uh, how many of you have seen organizations that could use this as their motto when it comes to metrics? And just give Dean a shout out. Has anybody been a victim of a math destruction weapon? Yeah, and if anybody yeah. just wanna chat into the chat box with any experiences or your thoughts, yes or no, have you been a victim to that kind of weapon of math destruction? Um, go ahead, chat that into the chat box. Dean, you getting any bites? Yeah, we're, we're getting some, yes, several times, uh, some other very descriptive um, <laughs> confirmations. <laughs> you know, All right. And, and it's interesting because it, you know, and, and I, I, I teach a lot on data analytics. And to me, oh. Joe, I hear some things around, you know, we, we stress focusing on the business value question first. Like, what's the business problem you're trying yes. to solve? And then follow with the data questions that you really need to ask. Is it similar to that? That's perfect. That's exactly the alignment you need. You got to figure out who you are and why you exist and who would miss you the most if you didn't. And then you got to build metrics that support that system. 
Unfortunately, you can build a pretty good system and then change your metrics. And now that metric will drive your system to be changed. And that's an illustration I'm going to give you. So as an environmental manager, uh, among other, other titles that I obtained in the operating facilities for the Department of Energy uh, at the Hanford site, and as a manager in two different facilities, uh, my job was to ensure not only that the supply chain was maintained so we could do our work, but that the waste stream was properly managed, that things went to where they're supposed to go and that we generated as little waste as possible. Now, I gotta tell you, there weren't any metrics at the time supporting that. That was a personal value I had that as Henry Ford once said, everything we consider a waste at the end of the process is actually leading to the inefficiencies in our process. You only have waste because you're inefficient. And so uh, when I was uh, helping to manage these facilities, I was also responsible for getting that waste to its final destination. And I learned early on that there was a problem with the system. You see, there was no waste management company involved who got paid by the cubic meter for every drum that was shipped. In order to have these waste treatment facilities, the Department of Energy uh, required the contractors to forecast how much waste would be generated in one year to five years. And so you really had to anticipate what your processes would look like in five years. And with an every four year change in the administration at the top level, that was a little hard to predict, but that was the demand. You gotta tell us five years from now, how much you're gonna generate. Reason was, is these waste receiving facilities like the waste isolation pilot plant in WIP, uh, some of the low level waste compaction areas we sent waste to, they didn't operate with revenue, they operated with funding. And when you can't charge your customer more, you better charge enough up front to keep your people employed and to build capital for the buildings that receive the waste. So waste forecasting became an art and a science. And we would say, we're gonna generate this type of waste in these many containers. Now, unexpectedly, if you underestimated the amount of waste you were gonna ship, they charged you a substantial penalty for shipping them more than you thought you'd uh, than you originally stated you'd send. So if your mission changed from production to uh, demolition and you suddenly generated great volumes of waste, well, that didn't matter to the forecast. What we ended up doing was eating the waste on the property by storing it in a less safe condition than if it had been sent to the waste disposal place in the first place who's prepared to take it. We got some several unintended consequences. Now, the opposite was also true. If we came up with some great ideas to minimize the amount of waste, those ideas didn't have an incentive because if you decrease the amount of waste, the receiving facility still charged you exactly the same amount. So if you go to a plant manager or an engineering manager and say, if we did things this way, we would produce this much waste, there was no incentive for them to buy into a better idea. In fact, they'd be penalized because they still have to pay the same amount for waste, even if they reduced it. So the Department of Energy came up with a new metric between 1991 to 1993. And it just simply stated that if you reduce the volume of waste, you'll be rewarded for that. You know, we understand there's a penalty right now. There's some uh, artificial externalities in our economy that are forcing you to make bad decisions. So if you reduce your waste, ship, we're gonna go ahead and, and give you an, a better award fee. Now, the intent was honorable. It was to focus on source reduction, front end supply chain, processes and inefficiencies, alternative technologies than the ones you're currently using that produce a less hazardous waste stream in the end. All that was honorable, but that's not what happened. What happened instead is those sites that found out if you volume reduce your waste, you could take credit for not doing the right thing up front, but for hiding your sins in the end by just simply reducing the volume for the super compaction, they're the ones that look like the champions. So it rewarded the end of pipe reduction leading to an increase in poor planning and materials management. You go out to a work crew and you tell them that if you use isopropyl alcohol rather than acetone in your process with acetone being a listed hazardous waste, then we don't have to treat it as a hazardous waste. They look at you daftly and say, what difference does it make? We're gonna throw this in a drum and reduce it to the size of a hockey puck, so who cares? Now here's the problem. 
The metric that should have driven us to better decisions instead drove us to even poorer practices. Do you think that has happened in other industries? Just, I'm looking for a little dialogue with the group. Anybody ever seen that? Where the metric was honorable, you had a good target, but man, it drove you to some destructive practices. Yeah, let's see if anybody wants to share an example. Just jump into the conversation it. or chat. Uh, Joe, Joe I'll, uh, I'll throw one in. This is, this is Bob. Yeah. Uh, experiencing this in my world of, of RCA and having a client with the well-intended uh uh, well intentions of an effective RCA program. Yes, they would put a, they would put a quota on the number of RCAs done, <laughs> and met to match the performance evaluation, but not the effectiveness of any of them. So I love if, it. I, if I had to have five done before the end of the year, you'd have people doing RCAs on why the Snickers bar doesn't come out of the machine, <laughs> and they and they met the the checkbox. Uh, and then, and uh, you know, for the effort itself, you couldn't yield any ROI because it was not the expectation. It wasn't part of the goal. Oh my gosh, that is an excellent example of math uh, destruction. That's perfect. Uh, Jessica Morgan has one. Hey, Jess. Jess, I think oh. you're muted. Oh, Jess, are you muted? Well, we're getting a lot in the chat, a lot of good examples. Well, okay, so uh, what are those, Dean? Yeah, so they're, you know, everything from happens a lot with recordable injuries, um, yes. you know, other safety examples, call center volumes. Um, oh, good call center one. Metrics is another good one. And, you know, I can think of a few that I've seen in, in analytics where maybe we measure the success of an advertising campaign with how many people clicked on a link versus yes. sell more pizzas. That's excellent. Clickbait is a big one. You know, yeah. it, it provides the person who paid for the advertising the false sense of security that the advertising paid off when really all they did was click it. Yeah. It's, oh, great examples. Uh, now, again, for your consideration is think about the metrics you're using, because I know the system drives the metrics. But remember, that metric is going to drive your system. And, and here's a couple of things I earned. I learned early in my career as a first line manager, there is no reason to measure if you are unable or unaware of how that measurement is being achieved, affected, or used. What difference does that make if that chart says something, if I have no idea how I affect that chart? A real one that I learned as time goes on with people who measure what I would say inappropriate indicators is the quantitative positive results like lost workday cases, uh, plants that don't trip offline, reliability indicators. Quantitative positive results do not indicate a qualitative positive process. As we'll see, there's a great deal of luck once in a while that's achieved. And we don't understand that some luck is guiding us in our achievement until one day we aren't as lucky. And then it is always easier to measure things that happened rather than things that haven't happened. As our friend Shane Bush says, uh, production speaks volumes. It yells at you. You got this many widgets out and they were of this type or quality. But what you don't know is how you prevented the wrong type and the wrong quality along the way. So it speaks volumes. Prevention is hard to measure. Now I'm gonna give you a, a poll question here just to kind of give you an analogy about the way we set our purpose and then how sometimes those measurements can't tell you whether you achieved it. So a lot of people take family vacations. Pre-COVID, a lot of us took trips with our family or individually with our friends. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Why do you take family vacations? Was it A, to have fun? Or I'm sorry, one, to have fun. Two, to build memories. Three, to create bonding moments. Four, to see new things and see new experiences. Five, to flee the neighbors. I gotta tell you that one, that's been a side issue once in a while. And six, you have another reason for taking a family vacation. So go ahead and just populate the chat box. One, two, three, four, why do we take family vacations? Could be a combination, but is there something you have to have happen that's more important than the rest? If this doesn't happen, it's not a good family vacation. 
Well, so far, we're getting a lot of responses in here. Two seems to be the most popular, just kind of like giving it a swag, Joe. Um, oh, that's it. Got Good. A, we got an all the above. <laughs> yes. And, then, yes. Um, and there are, so two is definitely the most prevalent. There's a couple of multi-voting, which is four and two. Uh, oh, yeah. And then, you know, probably the most telling response is vacation. What vacation? There you go. That's exactly right. So if you went on a family vacation, notice your purpose. You always get together to plan with purpose. And you say, because the destination determines if it's going to meet your purpose. So you don't just kind of, as my wife and I have done once in a while, willingly and knowingly just gone out on an adventure, have no clue where we're going, called a road trip. And if we get somewhere, we get somewhere. But the purpose was still to have fun. We didn't go there to have a miserable experience. Now, Let's say that you took that family vacation and you returned home and your neighbor peeks over the fence and asks you, hey, how was it? Well, some organizations would answer this way. Uh, we logged 700 miles. We stayed in six hotels. We spent $1,200 on souvenirs and we didn't lose a single family member along the way, which doesn't tell them anything about whether you attained your purpose or not. You see, the purpose of your trip was identified up front. And yet, how do any of these qualitatively answer the question that you were just asked by your neighbor. They don't. Who cares how many miles you went? Who cares how much money you spent on the souvenir? And you wouldn't expect to lose a family member. So why was that even part of the discussion when you got back? Does this response identify whether the trip met your purpose or not? What do you think? And I think most people would say no. Oh. Yeah, would you uh, a lot of no's coming into the chat box, Joe. Now think about it. We have a divorce going on, a separation, a chasm. We have over here the purpose and why we exist and what we're doing. And over here, the metrics that are going to drive that purpose ultimately. And yet you could log 700 miles, stay in different hotels and not meet your purpose in any way. And nobody's going to know whether it happened or not. See, I'm sensing that that laboratory I went to has metrics that don't meet their purpose. The purpose, which is to fulfill the obligation they have for the patients coming in, isn't being met by whatever metric, or that metric has been written and the people doing the work don't understand it. So there's always an argument, well, Joe, we gotta have zero. Zero is always what we gotta have. And Karsten Bush does a great job finally summarizing in a way that I could understand the objection to somebody's objection about zero. I see when you work with safety directors, they are married to the idea of zero. And they'll eventually, as they must have with Carson, tell me, well, Joe, if we don't set our metric at zero, then you must want our people to get hurt. Which one of my people do you want to see injured on this job? They get very offended by it when I say, why is zero a number you're considering? Now, Carson came up with this response. I don't have a zero hitting the lamppost on the way to the store metric. Does that mean if I didn't hit the lamppost, this goal is working even without my knowledge? I mean, imagine that. You go to the store and your wife asks you when you get back, hey, did you hit any lampposts along the way? No, well, then you must have had a program so that you don't hit lampposts. And if you say, well, I don't really need to set a zero metric for that, uh, you might get the answer, well, if you don't set that metric, then you must want to hit a lamppost along the way. So yeah, does, there's no logical conclusion there. One has nothing to do with the other. But how many times have you seen people use that type of argument to justify the metric in safety? Does that make sense? It, it definitely makes sense, Joe. Now, let's talk about that time of vacation. What if you get back and your neighbor says, so, did you hit any lampposts along the way? No, I didn't hit a single lamppost. Well, that must be because you set a zero metric for not hitting lampposts, and therefore it didn't have, well, one has nothing to do with the other. But all too often, that metric is set capriciously and without merit. Now, I, I learned a lesson on my first month as a first-line supervisor because I used to be the person in the field who did the work, and now I'm in the person helping the people do the work from a distance. 
And, and I met with a great guy named Ron Bliss, who was the vice president of operations for the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. And Ron had a great practice as a senior manager that when somebody was in their first month of as a supervisor, he would do a brown bag luncheon with them, getting to know the organization, getting to know him personally, getting to know. And he would do it with the craft and he would do it with engineers. He would just pick somebody twice a week and they would have a lunch together. That's how he got to know the people in his organization. He had 1,200, so it was a daunting experience to try to fit that in. But there I am, lucky enough to spend some time with him. And I said, hey, Ron, I'm be honest with you. I know what a supervisor does. I know what my manager does. Kind of know what the director does. I don't have a clue knowing what a vice president does. I don't know, really, Ron, what you do in your position. And he said, oh, let me show you. And he walked me out to the hallway and there was a bulletin board that had all kinds of KPIs and OKRs and all kinds of metrics on it. And he pointed to them and he said this, if anyone in our organization cannot tell me how their decisions and actions on a daily basis affects these numbers, I haven't done my job as a leader. I'll tell you, that resonated with me and it stuck with me my entire life. Here's why. The leader picks the metrics. And if the metrics are incorrect, then they shouldn't be surprised that the decisions and actions are the way they are back in the field. But if you can't tell somebody at every level of the organization how what they do on a regular basis affects any of these, why are you measuring it in the first place? There has got to be a relationship between what you're trying to achieve, Tiffany and the real goal she was after, and what you're currently achieving, um, and sometimes people can't explain that. I'll be honest with you, I've worked with workers who have no idea how what they do affects any of the metrics that their management is measuring. Has that been anybody else's experience as well? Okay, let's just, anybody wanna share an example, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself or chat into the chat box if you've seen that before. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Guess at the kind of responses we get, Joe. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll get a lot of uh, a lot of positives on that one. That they uh, that the, that people in the organization can connect the dots between their actions and the metric, or that they usually can't. Let's see what people say, but I I will bet it's a cannot. No. Yeah. Well, th that'd be my experience. One of the things we challenge safety, quality, and, and reliability teams, whatever they call them, is we challenge them to take a look at the metrics they're setting for their improvement plans, and then ask them, can the people in the organization that your team supports connect the dots between what we're trying to achieve metrically and what they do on a regular basis? And if they can't, you need to. And there's an interesting one that came in, Joe, and it just sort of alludes to the... Um... What about when metrics or priorities conflict? You know, we say safety is important. We say it's important, but we emphasize production or, you know, some other metric that sends a uh, conflicting message. Boy, that's a good one. I, I'll open up to the floor first before I share any of my opinions. But, but uh, does anybody have an answer to that? What if you have a production goal that seems to be at odds with the safety goal? Um, anybody have a solution, answer, or experience to that. And please feel free to, I guess, being chime in vocally, not just in chat. Is that right? Absolutely. Feel, you know, feel free to just unmute yourself if you've got uh, an example of where you might have conflicting goals or messages um, and how that played out and maybe what you did to, to address it. See if anybody wants to, uh, to jump in there. Just wait there for a second, Joe. Someone's got to have a good story to tell. They got to. I think that people make when you when your safety and production are in conflict, people make risk based decisions, and rather than considering the the uh, the one with the more severe consequences, they consider the one that's less likely as the one they'll sacrifice. Oh, sweet! Yeah, because that's, that's got better. more immediate like potential consequences or something, Bill? Yeah, if I've got a 90% chance of getting away with this and I can meet my production goal, you know, then that's probably not going to happen. 
I think somebody put it well, I forget who it was. 90% sounds like a good number for success rate. But if you were getting on a flight cross country and they told you there's a 90% chance you land, you would not do it. <laughs> That's right. Well, I really appreciate your comment there. And I, and, and I know people, and here's the issue is think about it. Somebody created the metric and, and they're holding the people who are furthest away from the metric responsible for meeting it. And yet those folks have to make, I love what you said, a risk-based decision, which of these is going to cost me more in the end. Now, I'll be honest, as an environmental manager, as a person involved in worker protection, as a, an operations manager, having seen the world through different lenses, I am a firm believer that safety, environmental stewardship, and productivity are not mutually exclusive. I think they have to be triple cost accounted. And if you have the right metric, you'll get that. Unfortunately, they're developed by different disciplines within the same organization. So safety develops the safety metric, operations develops the productivity metric, you know, quality develops the zero defect metric. And at all times they are at odds with each other when really we need to do the hard work and it's hard work, do the hard work, getting our hands dirty to figure out how we're going to triple cost account for equally safe, environmentally conscious, and productive performance. Got to be that way. I know companies who do it, and, and, and they do it well, and that metric drives the decision they make about source reduction, tool selection, scope of work, desired end results. It is difficult. It is much easier to go for zero. And Joe, we have uh, Charles Thompson. Charles, you're, you're unmuted. Charles, what's your thought or observation here? Oh, maybe it's just a... Uh, just an unmute. Yeah, oh. just an unmute, which is fine. Yeah, so yeah. Joe, you touched on something that I think I want to circle back to because I'm curious about it. You, it's hard work to do all that, right? It's oh, yeah. hard work. Is that why we don't do it? Because it's hard? I, I think so. And, and unfortunately, I think two things... Uh, and Dean, I appreciate the question. I think, you know, it's a deeper issue. I think sometimes people grow up in an organization and, and they don't know what metrics are even being measured. The first time they go to a board meeting, they find out the scorecard used for the board of governors or of directors is different than the scorecard used out in the field. They had no idea there were two scorecards going on. Uh, and I think it, it's hard work to say, um, you know, let's measure the quality of that family vacation. You know, what are we really after? Because that should drive your trip and your planning. Instead, well, how many miles can we put in on a day? Uh, what hotels can we select before we get there? Uh, how many meals are we going to, you know, the things that are easy to count get counted. But as Einstein and everybody knows said, the things that count sometimes don't count. And, and yet we're counting them. And the things that count aren't being counted. And so that's, I, I think it's hard work. I think it's an excellent exercise in the organization because it causes people to focus on aspects of their business they never considered. And that's why operations managers need to be as involved in developing the safety metrics as their safety professionals are. Now, let's face it, the first safety professional on every job is the foreman, period. That person has got to advocate on behalf of their workers. So, and I've seen too often metrics that have gone up on a board and they'll say, well, safety created that. It's not realistic. We'll try to attain it because if you don't have, you know, excellence as your standard, you'll have mediocrity as your standard. Well, yeah, that all sounds good, but here's the deal. Uh, how do you as a foreman affect that measurement? And number two, do you believe you can affect the measurement? You know, there's got to be a belief there that you have some way of swaying that number one way or the other. And if we can articulate how we positively affect it, oh, it'll be affected locally by whatever way people choose. Hiding numbers, massaging injuries, you know, underreporting. Oh, please, uh, Robert's got one, Blaylock. Yeah, I got a comment for you, Joe. Most of my- Robert, career, good to see you again, by the way. Good to see you, Joe. Most of my career has been in the safety function area uh, in health area, but, my formal education is in uh, operations uh, management and economics. So oh, okay. bring a little bit different perspective to the safety table when I'm talking about that. But what I've seen in my career is a smoothly running operation 
say, a, a great OEE from a financial uh, metric standpoint where it's measuring, measuring all the inputs to everything. But anytime there's not a hiccup and anytime the organization moves closer to a, a continuous operation instead of a cyclical operation without unexpected events happening, in my mind, I've got a safe organization. Yeah. And, and, and I don't care if they spend multi-millions of dollars on a, a 5S program and in, in, in operations or in, in maintenance. I was asked that one time, what do you think about that? And I said, I think they're spending $5 million on a safety program as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, And again, the, the metrics are going to drive your system and the things you choose to improve your system. And you got to ask, is it real improvement? And uh, no, that's great. Robert, thank you very much for that. Now, now, here's the thing. There are people who are committed to a metric because for a while now we've been measuring and we've gotten positive results. I know if you've read the book, you're about to make a mistake and I can help you stop doing that by Oliver Saboni. Uh, he said that Paul the Psychic Octopus would be seen as a great predictor of future success because he picked all 12 winners in the 2010 World Cup. Uh, they would put the two teams there underwater in terms of the food packages and whatever uh, food package Paul crawled over to, that was the team that was going to win. And he got it right 12 out of 12 times. Now, I'm not sure anybody would put money on the table that he's going to get it right on the 13th time. But, you know, past success tells us that whatever we're doing may be the thing we need to do because we're results driven. It's getting us zero. One of my favorite that came out of that book was this, because I have often wondered why I do the same. Every financial investor will tell you that past performance is not indicative of future success. So why would you even look at their past historical record? If you really believe that, and they tell you in that meeting, hey, now we've done pretty good up to this point in time with our portfolio, but don't look at what we've done up to this point in time because there's no guarantee next year is gonna look the same. I think all of us can appreciate time change given COVID and other things, but why do we still go back and look at past performance when we're told not to? They just told us, don't look at what I did in the past because it's, no, it's not indicative of what I'm gonna do tomorrow. In other words, I may completely fail, but we still go back and look at their history. Why? Because we believe in the results driven metric. Oh, Dean, did you have one on that? Yeah, well, I wanted to bring Tanya Hewitt into the conversation. Oh, she good. just posted about, about metrics and, you know, not using figures that are unknown and unknowable. And I was intrigued by that. And it, it definitely has a fit here. So, Tanya, can you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Well, Hi, actually, Tanya. Hi, Joe. <laughs> good uh, to see you. So, Dean, the, the quote is from, you know, from the pioneer of, a lot of statistical process control where a lot of, I think a lot of metrics are thought to have derived from, uh, from Edward Stemming. Yes. So yep. He, he has a video that was shot, was attributed uh, to 1984 when he came back to the States after teaching Japan how to, how to do quality as part of, part of the way that you do work, as opposed to just mass production and checking things occasionally to see if they conform with uh, the quality standards that you have, which is kind of the same world that we're in today as we were in the post-World -war, War II era. And he saw a lot of problems with this. 1984, as an elder statesman, he came and shot that video of the five deadly diseases, all of which I think can be applied today as they might have been applied in 1984. Sweet. And the one, the one on measurement, the one that Dean had uh, quoted there, you know, the over-reliance on numeracy is, uh, is killing us. Like there's so much more to being able to collect data than just having charts and graphs and numbers that can be put on histograms. That's we, we can do a lot better than that. I appreciate that because that's where we're going next. That is a perfect segue into what we ought to be looking at versus what we traditionally look at. Uh, that's key. I appreciate that, Tanya. You know, the, the reason why people like to go with the past performance, the reason why we like it when uh, an octopus or a cat picks the winners and we begin to depend on that, we know 
unpredictable predictability that they seem to possess is that it gives you the illusory comfort that zero accidents and zero injuries gives you. Uh, but as isolated performance metrics without accompanying qualitative metrics, none of them signifies whether the work was being performed as expected or not. It just means you didn't suffer a consequence severe enough to warrant attention yet. As Carson points out in his book, uh, the lost workday case is not indicative of people doing work safely. It's indicative of them not having an injury. Can I routinely ask craft people this in a meeting? Can you do the work unsafely and not be injured? What do you think the answer is? Sure, people do it all the time, around the house, at work. You can do the work unsafely without being injured. It doesn't mean you're not gonna be injured. It just means right now in the span of time, you picked the 12 winners and it hasn't happened to you yet. And so when we go out to take a look at what's going on, we focus sometimes only on one half of the equation. Once again, a strong recommendation read is Beyond Performance 2.0, really brought some thought to the thought process that I have in metrics. We need to monitor and measure both performance and health metrics or indicators. You have to have both. And here's an example of them. Performance indicators measure compliance to standards and the way you inspect them. You know, how many safety audits did you do? How many, uh, how many uh, quality uh, surveillances did you do? So on the left-hand side, we look at non-compliances and violations, training that was assigned and completed. So the people who didn't show up and the people who did, pre-job and pre-task meetings that were performed, not how well they were done, but the number that were done, and then lost workday cases and OSHA recordables. Now, the health side of that would be, what kinds of issues are you finding out there? And are you resolving them at the right level? That's a qualitative measurement. Who's finding them and are they resolving them? The effect training has on work planning and execution. For instance, we know this with senior leaders, when you're developing training for an organization, trainers care a lot as well as the students about learning objectives. They want to know what we're walking away with. But leaders care about learning impact. Learning impact means how does that objective get us to where we want to be as an organization? And so the effect on training and work planning and execution, improvements made due to the pre and post jobs. So how are you constantly evolving your work to a safer, more productive environment? and improvements in defenses and controls. Now that's not the complete list, it's not even a short list, but I think every organization needs to sit down and take a look at its current performance metrics and have an equal and not always opposite health metric. What does it mean? So let me ask the people that are participating, what does the health of the organization mean to you? Performance means, did you meet a standard? But what's the health of the organization mean to you? Defenses. Yes, I agree. Defense has got to be present. Otherwise, it's sheer luck or you don't know if it's luck. Does anybody else want to unmute themselves and jump into this conversation? And I was going to say out. performance with the appropriate behaviors. Oh, okay. Performance, you, you, those violations and non-compliances or compliances and the lack of violations were driven by a behavior. Um, and what is that behavior? Yeah, I think, and that's a tougher one to measure and identify, but good. Joe? Yes. I would say contributions toward solving problems. Yeah, oh, I love Robin. Is that is that Robin? I hear that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, I agree. The kind, we're going to use a slide later from uh, two organizations I worked with who taught me a great deal about how they're measuring success. And it has a lot to do with that. The contribution to solving problems. Whose contribution? What kind of problem? Who owns the solution? Yeah, I think that's looking at the health of the organization. And, but, but and again, the more that those con contributions are coming from the workers. I think the increase we can see in the health of the organization. I would not disagree in any way with that. I think you're 100% right. And it also shows they're paying attention to what matters most. And so 
let me give you some non-occupational examples in my career. For 17 years, I worked as a business liaison on general advisory committees for different public school systems. Um, back in those days, they were concerned about people not wanting to learn because they didn't see a purpose behind what they were learning. That's a question every eighth grader has. How am I ever going to use this algebra a day in my life? This is, I want to learn about a checkbook. I don't want to learn about the isosceles triangle. And so, so, you know, there's got to be a happy medium there. We know you don't know what you don't know unless you're exposed to it. So there's a reason to take certain courses. Otherwise, you'll never be exposed to that information. But if that information, once exposed to, doesn't have a purpose, you may lose the retention of it. And so, so schools were very interested in being more impactful in the school environment. So one of my dear friends, Dr. Jim Parsley, who's a great educator himself and then an administrator in the bank. Hoover Public School said, hey, you know, he's aware in his 30 years that GPAs are easily gained, especially in the high school level. You know, parents always think their kids want to be successful in life because kids tell them that. So they want to take this AP honors class and that pottery class and that leather shop class and you name it, they'll tell you why. Now, what they really want in surveys is to be with their friends. They get together on freshman orientation day and the first question they ask their sophomore friends is, who's the easiest teacher you have and what's their grading like? And so, you know, they, they might come at school a little differently than their parents believe. And so the GPA back then was a measurement, not of how much you learned, but maybe of how much you knew before you even started. If you're great at math and you walk into a math class and it's not challenging, the A was never a goal. The A was an expectation. But if you're really bad at math and you walked into a math class and you improved your grade by two points from an F to a C, that doesn't look like an A, but guess what? You learned. So here's the whole point. He actually did something with it. So Jim was concerned that GPAs are easily gained. So employers and parents that he met with wanted to know how does that GPA tell me whether the student is reliable, ethical, self-disciplined, interested in learning, and self-motivated? It doesn't. So in their school district, they created a tier one through three system on report cards and progress reports. And it indicated by telling kids this on the first day of school and then weekly reminders about how to earn these tier one through three uh, reporting uh, metrics, uh, they turn all their work in on time. They don't have to be reminded. It requires zero to little supervision. You don't have to harp on them to remember. They accept advice and guidance on errors and mistakes, making them teachable. There was a list of nine things that went into that tier one through three system. Now, I'll tell you, the parents who attended meetings cared more about that one through three system and what it meant than they did about the 2.0 and 4, because they understood the 2.0 and 4. They wanted to know, well, why is he a two and not a one? Because it requires a lot of supervision, has to be reminded, and he doesn't challenge himself to learn anymore. Now, right, wrong, or indifferent, it was at least an attempt to measure something beyond the norm. Does that make sense? The other one is I worked with an alternative school for about uh, four years. And, uh, and they previously just wanted to get kids into the classroom. You know, if they just show up, we can do something with them. But these are alternative school kids who usually have alternative lifestyles, meaning not the traditional nuclear family. You know, they wake up together, have breakfast together. Uh, they make sure that the kids are being watched and things are being taken care of. These are kids who by and large raise themselves from the age of 13. Uh, they usually have to dress their younger brothers and sisters and get them off on the bus before they attend school themselves. And many of them were not challenged by traditional high school because there was nothing challenging about the workload. Uh, surprisingly, some of these kids completed their high school earlier than if they had gone to traditional high school because the work meant something to them. And so they previously measured total absences in six different homerooms. And every homeroom had 45 to 50 students. The average no-show at the time was 20 to 30 percent. Now they changed that uh, the year I worked with them to a positive indicator, the number totally present. And they hung it outside the classroom door like a United Way tote board, and it included coupons and incentives at the student store that if the homeroom met a goal of 93 percent attendance, they would get those coupons and incentives. If they didn't, 
the people in that class didn't get it. In three months, the change was from that 65 to 75% no shows. I mean, 65 to 75% shows. The average attendance improved to 95% plus in two of the homerooms. In four months, all of them had reached the 93% goal. Would you say there may have been a bit of peer pressure that was applied for those who weren't showing up on time? That they held each other to a different standard. See again, right, wrong, or indifferent, it was just an example of how people measure success differently. So one thing, a couple of things I wanted to share before we open it up for some continued dialogue is University of Indiana went out to ask managers and employers, what do you care about when it comes to measuring success in your organization? Then they asked their employees, hey, your managers told us, but what do you care about? And here was the contrast. Employers and managers routinely cited these things, lost workday cases, OSHA recordables, first aid injuries, and non-compliance and workman's comp injuries, which usually led to negotiating the severity of the injury or the nature of the injury, acute versus chronic, rather than the prevention and predictability of future injuries. In fact, many claim success because though the employee had been hurt, they can negotiate with the medical provider to return them to work as soon as possible. Now they asked employees the same thing. And they said, what we care about is what we see the managers or companies spend time and resources on. Behaviors and outcomes we see managers or the company reward or condone. The length of time taken to get something corrected once it's been identified as a safety issue. And what catches the attentions of managers and supervisors when they walk through our area and what misses their attention when they're with us. Now think about that last one. We pay attention to what they pay attention to, and we pay attention to what they're missing. Now that happened, as you know, at the Macondo oil well. We had several things going on in that deep water horizon story, but when Misha and Osha wrote the final report, I think they had a rather enlightening statement here for anybody who is managing safety processes. They said, having achieved a false sense of safety through observation programs that focused more on coffee spills than they did on oil spills, failure caused by organizationally accepted habits claimed the lives of 11 people and spilled over 5 million barrels of oil. Now, I love that phrase because I've been guilty of that myself. Focusing more on the things we can easily manage rather than the things that have to be managed. And so safety glasses that aren't worn, hard hats that aren't on, work packages that aren't being used. And yet, are we asking the workers the things that matter most to them that will affect us the most in the end? Coffee spills rather than oil spills. So what do managers do in organizations? They go out and do surveys. And if they don't have the pulse of the organization ready at their fingertips, they'll go out and ask people their opinion. And surveys, unfortunately, may not reflect reality, especially in the workplace. Respondents might perceive lower scores are gonna draw greater attention to things that now need to be corrected from their end. It's not about fixing the organization. Once again, it's about fixing me. Uh, the phrasing of the statements positively influence the selection of the response. So the way you state the statement gives you the response may not believe an honest answer will result in real workplace changes required to improve. Nobody's gonna do anything with this anyway. And my favorite one that I've seen too often, many surveys are more representative in responses to the pet peeves people had before they took them and the pet projects they want supported after they take them. Pet peeves and pet projects. And we now have evidence to support our conclusions. Most surveys look something like this. You put these words up there and people have to, I mean, think about the damage that might be done if you said, we don't show concern for each other in our daily work. Oh, what kind of laborious effort are you now gonna place on me if I admit to that? Uh, my supervisor sets a good example when it comes to safety in the workplace and you rate that one lower. Now, what kind of expectation is the supervisor gonna have for me when they get back from that meeting with mid managers that said, hey, here's the way you folks see ya. I don't think my world's gonna be improved. I think my world be a little bit more effortful than it used to be. So here's the question, why ask an opinion when you can go out and evaluate the evidence? The evidence of what's happening in the workplace is all around us. 
why ask people their opinion of what's happening? In fact, the people who put together artificial intelligence processes would say, you're violating the third law of artificial intelligence, according to Stuart Russell and Judah Pearl. You see, the third law is this, to understand human preferences, just observe human behavior. Don't ask them what they want. Don't ask them what they're feeling. Go out and see the way they demonstrate what they want and demonstrate the way they're feeling. One of the funniest surveys you'll ever see is what people will tell you they'll buy at a supermarket before going in. And surveys about nutrition indicate we buy a lot more broccoli than cookies, but exit observations indicate that isn't true. You see, asking an opinion doesn't always give you the real result. Best source of information for me is this, attend pre-job meetings, pre-task meetings, after action reviews, post reviews and what you're doing with the information, near miss and incident reports, work planning meetings, observing work in progress. The evidence about what people really want and the way they feel is around us all the time. But it is easier to do a survey than to pay attention to the people's needs, all too often in the organization. Uh, would anybody disagree or, or does that make sense? I, I, I want to comment on the prep peeps. Um, so we have about 100 people on our shop floor here. I should yeah. say this is this is manufacturing based human performance, not safety. But um, yeah. and I did a workshop with them, two hour workshop. I covered all three shifts last year. And, and there are a lot of pet peeves, right? And, and I basically it was supposed to be a two hour workshop and it turned into a two and a half hour workshop with a half hour of pet peeves. But what I, I think that's useful information um, because when I started to address some of their pet peeves, which honestly may or may not improve our performance, when they saw that I addressed those pet peeves, we got a lot more feedback and we got a yeah. lot more useful feedback. So I think I, I see what you're saying about surveys, but I think pet peeves, there is some value in understanding what their pet peeves are. Um, because that's, I so you, appreciate what you said. And, and I think one of the keys there that you said is you personally were working with them in a group and you were dialoguing with them, notice you didn't send them a survey in writing or on a tablet and say, hey, log on to SurveyMonkey right. and just answer. See, I think the biggest difference is that's a personal approach. And, you know, uh, as some authors have cited, it's like the Hawthorne effect. You know, people now see you're empathetic, not because you changed the lighting in the room or you gave us better tools, but you indicated that you care. And we didn't even know anybody cared. And so I 100% support what you did because it's personal and in person. Uh, okay, what I was yeah. referring to is, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. I just I just think I was just, but I, I do think it's important to find other pet peeves. But one thing I will, I will throw out, we were supposed to, we were targeting a 20% reduction in our missed entries. And we got an 80% reduction. That's great. Now, and why do you think that is? I think it was from the workshops, but I can't convince yeah. my management. It wasn't. <laughs> I, I so I, how do I convince them? I, oh, man. So there, there you go. Uh, you know what? That is a great question. And I think going into something like that, and, and we're doing it right now, we have coaches and mentors like a lot of people do out in the field. And, and we're doing a workshop tomorrow afternoon with them because when we ask directors and vice presidents, hey, if this coach and mentor goes out there to talk to folks, what's the metric you're going to do use to move the needle? And they said, uh, we don't know. That's up to you to tell us. And so, well, what are your expectations for these mentors and coaches? In other words, for these workshops? Um, I don't know, just to improve things. You got to narrow that down. You know, how, you can't achieve a goal unless you start with one in mind to begin with. So I think you're right. I think up front during these workshops, you've really got to think about how is this going to move the needle? By learning what really bugs people in their pet peeves, we're going to gain more information like in learning teams than we would have through a structured causal analysis in some cases, like a, a lesson plan, I mean, a, a, a lessons learned team. So I, I think it's a great question. I, I think we might be able to discuss that here in a moment, but uh, I appreciate you bringing up that example and, 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 I, and clarifying the difference between surveys and being personally involved. Now, there was, a, there was a group we worked with for about 17 years, and they believed in an observation process. Hey, we're going to go out there. 
We're going to take note of what people are doing and have conversations. This checklist was in their head. It was never in their hand, which is always a good practice. They never did an observation without talking to people about it. You have to learn something from an observation. Therefore, a conversation has to take place. You can't walk around and create a laundry list you're going to give somebody to fix. And so, but I loved dearly the director, the associate lab director who started this process. His response when we unveiled this new process to the rest of the directors who would quote unquote hold their supervisors accountable for using this process out in the field. Here was the dialogue. So how many should our supervisors complete on a weekly basis? That's what the director asked of the associate lab director when he said, we need to start doing these. Lab director's response was, as many as they believe will provide value. I'm not gonna set a numeric goal. They provide value or they don't. And then the director responded, well, if we don't set a numeric goal, then we won't know if they're doing them or not. To which he responded, I think the fact that things aren't improving and we're fixing the same issues over and over again will be evidence they aren't being done. The issue is not with compliance. The issue is and always will be, what are we learning, period. And at each and every staff meeting after the observation process was put in place, he would start his staff meetings off with this. What are we learning? So this week you went out and you did some things. What are you learning? What did you see? What did you observe? Best practices, practices that need to be addressed. I'm telling you within about two to three months of watching that organization, they grew the value of that program because they never once said, how many of these are you doing and you need to do more? Instead, they asked the quality that was being done. And people had stories. People had a lot of stories that were never told in the organization until they started using a process like this. So we know that the wrong key performance indicators can drive the wrong behavior. DuPont came up with that internally themselves when they were fined for solely using lagging indicators in one of their operations. And as an organization dedicated to safety, they knew there was a better way. So I normally ask people, if you couldn't measure right now the metrics that you're currently using what would you use instead? The answer I've gotten is this, we would measure the type of engagement that's going on. But Cindy Decker said it this way, every modern organization uses the same basic tools for safety and reliability, but they all succeed or fail based on the ability to effectively engage the employees. So as I finish up my time here this morning, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of things. Uh, number one is your incident reporting and corrective action planning speak volumes about what you're looking at and what you should be measuring. Are you trying to simply change motivation, which is not simple at all, trying to improve the attitudes because you determine behaviors are less than adequate? If you're looking at just motivating people versus making them more able, uh, then your metrics will show that. Your ability issues are the ones we need to focus on. And so many organizations spend some time at some point during the year to glean from their incident reports, all the corrective and preventative actions they put in place and see whether they were aimed at more affecting motivation and attitudes or more aimed at effectively helping people be more able. But the one I really want to share with is from Eugene, uh, the Eugene Water and Electric Board and a paper and pulp company who arrived at the same destination because of similar conditions and completely geographical uh, separated facilities. So the Electric Board and the paper and pulp mill had senior management tours. These folks would come by every three months and see people, you know, see what's going on out there. And they realized soon that some of the issues that people brought to them while they were on tour were issues that should have really been addressed by their foreman, their supervisor, their local safety committee or themselves. Why were they waiting until the senior tour before anybody said anything about the challenges they faced and the obstacles they had to climb over? Well, because the system they created gave them the result they were getting. They created a system where they didn't pay attention locally to the issues. It took senior management involvement to intervene to resolve them. And they did that unknowingly. 
So both organizations, they started an issues management system that specifically looked at who specifically identified the issue or improvement. Closest to the work, that's a green light. Hey man, our workers out in the field are identifying these issues, that's great. If it was the director, vice president, or mid manager that had to identify them, that was not seen as anything but a yellow light or a red light. Why did it have to rise to that level for somebody else to notice? So when your metric is closest to the work, you need to observe your training, your observation program, and your feedback systems follow suit. The type of issue was tracked, which had never been tracked before. Opportunities for improvement, found and we fixed it immediately, adverse conditions or significant issues, those were tracked. And at first, most realized only significant issues were making the marquee, getting the attention. But over time, by measuring this, they found out opportunities for improvement dwarfed the significant issues. They were finding things earlier, so the significance was mitigated. And who resolved the issue? The employee level, the supervisor level, the management level, was it the safety professional or the environmental professional that had to put a solution in place? Or did the workers actually generate the solution and was it satisfactory? The duration of time between when the issue was identified and its resolution. So if this issue was a big deal, why did it take so long to, uh, to fix it? And then finally, when warranted, the effectiveness review to go back and determine whether that resolution you put in place worked or not. Did we really get the fix we wanted? Now that required discipline. It required a great deal of effort. It's always easier just to find a problem and fix it. But in both those cases, they saw marked improvement in their processes because they now figured out where the flaws were in their process without waiting for the final metric. I just wanted to share a few of those thoughts. I know this is a big challenge for most folks. I greatly appreciate the input, but uh, Dean, I'm gonna open it up for questions or for just uh, hang on and, uh, and uh, talk. Perfect, Joe, thank you. So let's just see if people have questions. You wanna unmute yourself or raise your hand and uh, we can bring you into the conversation. Um, a simple, simple question for starters, Joe. Um, would you be willing to share your slides with participants oh, if they're interested? Absolutely. And, and Dean, you let me know how best, and I, I will get these to you. So let's do that. Before the end of the session, I'll chat my, uh, my email address into the chat box. Anybody that wants the slides, um, let me know, and, and I'll just coordinate with Joe that way. Um, Good. Robert Hunter, your, your hand is up. What do you think? So I have a question about measuring health versus, versus measuring metrics. So oftentimes, I think when we try to measure health, we try to mold that into some sort of composite metric that's really complicated and it's some sort of score or a number or something like that, which we've tried to do. And my leadership has rejected some of those efforts saying that if the metric's too complicated, if it's this score and you have to explain to me every time what it is, it's worthless to me. I want something simple, mm. something that I can look at and understand. So I guess what my real question is, how, what is a, a, a tangible way you can measure health outside of it being just, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, I think we're doing well. Oh, God, that's a good, I'd be very first, be interested if anybody has uh, some answers uh, for Robert uh, because of your experiences and trying to do the same. Anybody here? Came to having qualitative measurements rather than quantitative, not the number, but the effect. Waiting for a hand to go up or somebody to unmute themselves. Share an example. I mean, I, I'll throw up just an esoteric thing, Joe. Yeah. Is that foundationally, this always comes down to the same thing for me, but it's the it's the uh, cultural acceptance of a, a proactive mindset versus a reactive. And that if you are, if you excel at the proactive mindset, you should see a reduction in the need to react. And, and, there, and there's all sorts of ways to be able to, to measure that. But when uh, a lot of what you were going through is people identifying things uh, that they see that happen all the time, but don't get the attention of the people that can make a difference. So it gets incorporated as a cost of doing business and then it's just part of the job. 
So I, I uh, to answer that question, I, I see the the, uh, the the ways to be able to find out how, how do I uh, find out that people are, are being or practicing behaviors of being more proactive and it's being encouraged. And then I should see a decrease on the need for reaction. The, the first responders who get all the glory. Yeah, I, I and I and I really appreciate. It. I believe it was Robert's uh, comment. Is that right? It was Robert Hunter? Is that is that right? I really appreciate that. I understand where management's coming from, and he's right. I think my friend Ron Bliss would say, if you can't clearly explain how that metric can be reached, it's not going to be very meaningful because people have to make decisions and take actions, like Bob said, that are proactive in order to affect that number. So, so I've got to be able to understand how I affect that number. So it could be that you need to uh, chunk that number into smaller pieces. You know, like uh, we measure lost workday cases for safety. We measure zero defects for productivity or manufacturing. And so if you go to the healthy organization, it's worth the effort to get the people who need to consider what that looks like in a room and just debate it. You've got to beat that one about. There that's why people use quantitative metrics is because they're easy. How many observations do we have to do versus what are we trying to get out of these observations? What is it we're going to measure as to whether what we're doing matters? When we send coaches and mentors out, the number of visits to the site can be measured. That's quantitative. Every coach should be out there three days a week and visit two sites twice a day. Well, I can measure that. That's numbers. But what effect are they having on the people when they go out there? And, and I'm going to tell you, there, there is not an easy answer for that. I would refer you back to perform, Beyond Performance 2.0, where they have appendices with different health indicators. You know, the quality of the observation, not the quantity. Quality of the planning, meaning you went out, you did the job as planned. Why? Because it was planned as it should be performed. You know, there, you didn't have to rework that work package. You didn't have to recycle your product. All of those are indicators that quality is being affected. Um, and, and I really wish I could give you an easy answer. For me, the real gold that, you that you're after is that effort it takes to sit down with people and ask them, hey, what measures the health of our organization? And then next, in answer to your senior managers, can we make that metric, even if it has to be chunked, into smaller elements, can we make it meaningful so people can clearly see their actions that affect that metric? Uh, that's the best I can do. I, I, other than just working and, and, and going through it, I don't know how else you achieve it. So I am gonna jump in as your duly appointed facilitator because we have just about six minutes left. Um, okay. And first I'm gonna do so I love all the conversation because it centers around everything from, you know, I hear positive leaderships and how they, that correlates to employee engagement, you know, so the role of frontline leaders to senior leaders and, and having true positive relationships um, with the organization with people. I hear what, you know, the, the concepts about measurement and looking at business value and really tying what we measure to direction and strategy. Love it all. Um, that was a, a long road to a small house to just say that. <laughs> I'm going to go to Sharon Small because Sharon, you 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 touched on something about proactive does not necessarily mean pro-social, and I'd love to just Ooh. hear a little more about that. Okay, so am I there? You are there, Hello, Sharon. Hi, Joe. Nice uh, to see you. Yeah, good to be here this morning. Um, yeah, so uh, you know we talk about being um, proactive, but um, pro-social is towards a human being. It's, it's working in a way that is, you know, socially, let, let's, let's like even stop the engaging. We can, let's leave engagement and let's just bring contentment. I mean, I'd much rather have a contented worker than necessarily an engaged worker because engaged can only last so long, but contentment has a longer lifespan. So this <laughs> idea of, of, are we working in a way that, um, is to their benefit. I mean, think about the terms we use, human resource. Yeah. I find that a little bit offensive. Um, yeah. you know, how are you pro-social to a human resource, um, pro-social to a human being? And, and if you say safety comes down to the smallest things we do, then it comes down to the weakest one of us in a way, or the most vulnerable one of us. So I don't know. I 
Well, and I think if 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 you read some of the uh, the references that I use, that that I think that is ultimately their goal, is that we people are not cogs in a wheel. You just can't, as Frederick Taylor thought, crank them up using science scientific management principles because you can't engineer human beings into the performance. You know, psychology and sociology plays a bigger role in it, um, and and a lot of that is with the health mentally and physically of the people doing the work, and that's why I think that health indicator, though it's a tough one to get to, has got to be one you spend time struggling with because it's the more important metric at the end of the day. Yeah. And I appreciate your contribution on that too. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's fascinating that we expect a difference in relationship at work than we have, um, you know, in the grocery store or with our family and that, that workers, you know, that we find this fascinating. Isn't it fascinating that when they get to talk about things like pet peeves, isn't yeah. it fascinating that things get resolved when that's that right. how we function? It's kind of like you have to look at the broader scope of being human and how we manage relationships. It's it really isn't rocket science. Like literally, it is not in the numbers. But that's right. But you know, at least rocket science can be measured more easily. You know, the amount of fuel used, trajectory. <laughs> Human beings a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, I did want to leave uh, some things to think about between now and then. And, and I spoke to Dean about this earlier. A little homework, a little takeaway. If you go back and look at your organization's scorecard or whatever metrics you're currently keeping, number one, do these measure quantity or quality? Are they primarily designed for compliance or learning? The Data suggests out there, research-wise, that most metrics are based on compliance standards. Are we achieving a performance goal when they ought to be used for learning as well? Okay, what are we going to learn about it if we're not? Could everyone in your company explain clearly how they personally affect the metrics used to define success? And is there any element of your work that should be measured but isn't? Because, as I think Robert said earlier, it's either too difficult currently or currently indeterminable. Well, I just don't have a way to do it. I don't know how. It's worth taking the steps to figure it out because trust me, the gold in that conversation isn't the one we hang around our neck at the end of the day, the metric. The gold in the conversation is what got us there on a regular basis. And so, uh, and, and Dean, I'll leave you with that. Joe, that's, that's brilliant. And brilliant in, A, I appreciate everything that you shared with us today. I love I these questions it. because as we start thinking about how we take concepts, you know, and, and things that can be abstract, although supported with great stories and, and make them applicable to our roles and to organizations, this kind of framework that you have up on the slide on the, the, these four questions and considering those, I think are incredibly helpful. So, you know, I would, I'll do two things. One is I'd encourage everybody to think about these questions and more importantly, answer them as you start thinking about how you can apply the, the learning and the insights from today. What I would also love, and I'll put my email back into the, uh, the chat box, at the beginning of next month's webinar, um, which is always the fourth Thursday of, of the month, what I'd love to do is carve out, say, 15 minutes. If anybody wants to share their insights, stories, if you will, about your reflections or what you found as you looked at these four questions and you applied them to your, to your organization or you thought about them in the context of your organization, we would love to hear what you learned and what your insights were because it'll, it'll, I think that storytelling will help all of us learn a little bit. Um, I know Joe would probably love to hear more about yes. putting the practice as well. So um, I will put my email into the chat box right now. Um, that's for anybody. If you want slides, let me know. If you are willing to share a little bit more in one month's time about your reflections on, on these questions and, your, and the insights that you take away from today, please let me know because I would love to just hear the stories. And with that, I am just gonna say, Joe, thank you so much for, uh, thank thanks you. for the time. Thanks for sharing. Well, I thank everybody for joining us and for contributing, and I look forward to uh, future dialogues. It's great. Yeah. And everybody, thank you so much for taking the time today. We appreciate you it. And, uh, have a great rest of the day. All thank right. You. Thank you.